Hello and welcome to another Besides Our Own podcast. Exciting, exciting podcast. Indeed. My name is Scuba. Uh, Monk is on the other side of the table. We have... What's happening? No, nothing. Nothing very much, nothing nothing very much is happening. Yes. Nothing of any excitement at all, Craig. Yes. With your boring voice. <laughs> That's amazing. We have, unbelievably, Michael Hines, the producer and director of Still Game on the line. How are you doing, Michael? I'm very well, thank you. I, I'm not the producer. I used to produce the first series, but afterwards, people who are better than that job than me uh, took over, but I have directed every episode. Okay, okay. So, uh, well, that's an interesting start right there. Right there. It, cause it, like, on your profile, it it's says... It's going well. It's going well. It, it's a great start. We might get lots of other things wrong. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so, so, so what happened after season one that made you... Uh, did you like, give up the role, or was it like passed on to somebody else? I think when we realised it was going to be a successful show, there was a lot more to making it, and mm -hmm. uh, it was busy enough directing it. And uh, whilst I'm happy to produce, I'm not as good as it as proper producers. So we brought other people in to do it. So I think I think I did series one and two. I think, uh, and then I carried on directing there afterwards uh, and let people other people take over it uh, as soon as it started to grow. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, start at the beginning. Like we'll start at the beginning. Our usual first question. Is a, what made you get into the sort of the job that you do, the directing side of things? Oh, it's a long story. It's crazy. Basically, I was rubbish at everything else, um, <laughs> and uh, I used to. I, I did a variety of jobs when I left university, but one of the main things I did when I left university, they said the government said, if you want to claim your doll but not sign on and earn more than your doll, then set yourself up as a business. We'll pretend you're not unemployed. And you can call yourself a business because that's what everyone wants to do in those days. So I started off a business as a, a sort of a freelance drama teacher and uh, did an awful lot of youth theatre stuff. And I ran a dance company in Belfast. And for a while, I was a, a self-employed magician, uh, did kids parties and did an awful lot of work in that kind of area. And then Radio 5 started and I was a freelance reporter for them. So I was working around the media um, and BBC Education needed someone who could write and direct about a bullying drama from going from primary to secondary schools. And because I was working a lot in youth theatres with kids that age, I could get a really good performance out of the children. I knew nothing, nothing about directing cameras. I didn't know one end from the other, yeah. um, even though I'd done a film degree at Stirling. Um, but basically, I met the producer and he said, well, I can teach you the film bit. You just need that. We need someone who can get the performances. So I went straight in as a director. And ever since then, any young director said, how do you get into the industry? I'm like, not my way, uh, because it doesn't <laughs> happen anymore. So I, I got in that way, and um, I learned on the job. And on the first shoot, a cameraman said, I've got the measure of you. You're a failed actor. And he was probably right. Um, <laughs> and Jesus. since then, I, I've stuck to directing. I do produce, but uh, I love directing, and I've done it ever since. And, and my career path went from BBC Education to BBC Children's. You two are probably young enough to remember 50-50. Um, yes, yes. Kids show with the big inflatables, yeah. Uh, so I used to direct that and the set of okay. kids shows and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then um, I ended up switching over to chewing the fat and then still game, but we can talk about that whenever. We'll definitely get into that soon at some so point. So there's something we need to sort of clear up, which we were supposed to do before we started recording, but we'll just do it on Good thing. Point, aye, aye. Somebody mentioned that you'd done uh, Two Doors Down, but we think they've mixed up Michael Hines and Simon Hind. They have. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Somebody had a question for later on, so we'll, we'll cut <laughs> that, that out. <laughs> that's, that's the easiest way to do it. Simon did a brilliant job on it. Uh, I think he did a terrific job, but I have never done that show. It's a great show, but I've never done it. Okay. Yeah, we, we, looked, we looked through because we, we couldn't find evidence of that. Yeah. But we just wanted to check and make sure. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> You've got me wondering now. I'm just having a look. Thinking <laughs> I've been Were you even there, Michael? You never know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, one thing I want to ask, like, was this all in England you started doing this stuff or had you moved up to Scotland at a young age? You know, I moved up to Scotland at, at, at not so young age, but uh, uh, basically my mum moved up to Scotland in January 1983. Uh, she had a pal who lived in Dollar and she was a health visitor and moved out to Alloa and Alva and the Hillfoot villages. And I... Uh, moved in with my neighbour and went and did my A-levels and spectacularly fucked them up because uh, I joined a band. <laughs> nice. And, of course, I was just a, I was a 16, 17-year-old growing up um, yeah. without parents. 
So I failed, so I came to Scotland and I went to Alva and I went to school in Alva to do my hires and then I went to Stirling University uh, and then when I left Stirling University, my mum fell ill with cancer uh, in 1988, 89 and even at that point, I'd been in Scotland a few years, I might have had thoughts of going back to England. By then I was quite settled in Scotland, yeah. so I lived in Bridge of Allen and said, oh, well, I would, you know, I'd stick around and look after my mum. And she lived for another 11, 12 years. And by that point, I completely settled. So my entire working life, I've lived in Scotland, although I have worked in England for MTV. I've done Biker Grove and blah, blah, blah. But I've never, I've, all my shows have been basically out of Scotland. And that's where I live and that's where I love living. I wouldn't live anywhere else but there. Mm-hmm. You'd be so used to it now as well, which is like, mm-hmm. or, or, like th- this is one of the things about like chewing the fat and still game. Like there was people wondering like how you even got into that like line of work. But again, if you've been here since that, like for that length of time, you would have been totally used to the accent. It would not have bored you. And you understand a lot of the Scottish humour as well, I would, I would assume. Well, that's not strictly true. Was it not? But basically, I didn't know chewing the fat. Well, I'll tell you what happened was um, the designer of 5050, uh, a lovely guy called Graham Rose, who me and him used to design all these mad games with inflatables and stuff like that. The guys at Chewing the Fat were going to network across the whole of Britain, not just in Scotland, and they were looking for someone who had network experience, which I had because I'd done children's dramas, which were across the whole of Britain. And the designer said to Ford and Greg, oh, you should meet this guy, Michael Hines. He's quite funny, bless him. And uh, he does a lot of comedy. So I went and had a talk with Ford and Greg, but I didn't really know Chewing the Fat at that time, particularly. I wasn't a great TV viewer. I, I used to go out all the time and see bands and stuff. So I wasn't someone who sat in and watched TV that much, even though I worked in the industry. And I met Ford and Greg and ended up doing Chewing the Fat. But this is an absolutely true story. One of the episodes of Still Game, um, I was reading it and I had to read it in a really shit Scottish accent, really quietly, because I could not understand what I was reading. And it said... <laughs> Uh, the thing that was said, um, it was it said it, there was a goat, like the livestock, a goat, and then afterwards was W A N one, as in Tilly Wally, as in pale. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck's a farm animal doing? And then I realised he said, I've got one, I've got one. Oh. And, and for oh. me, it, you see what I mean? And it's like, and it was, and the boys always wrote like that. So there's a great scene where <laughs> there's a guy who's talking to Winston, just says, Ernie, you know, U R R N A E, which means no, I am not. I think you will find. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and I was like. Ernie, what the fuck's Ernie? So, and and just to finish that off, when we did a behind the scenes in series three, someone on YouTube had put it up and gone, I can't believe the director's English. But the thing for me is I'm a northern lad. My father's family from Liverpool area, Birkenhead. And I think Liverpool and Glasgow are almost identical. And yes. I think the north of Scotland, the central belt of Scotland are almost identical. So I've always got that Scottish sense of humour. And because I've lived here longer than most of the Neds who uh, shouted it, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm Scottish, I just have an English accent, a Northern English accent. Although I will use Scottish phrases like, where do you stay, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. I just uh, I wrote down wrong again uh, for me, so because I was wrong. Um, You're just going to mark down every time. I'm just going to mark, <laughs> I've, I've got a wee tally here of like every time I'm wrong. <laughs> That's so perfect. Uh, so, the, <laughs> so the move to Chewing the Fat. That was um, uh, season three. Uh, I can't remember, it's the last season. And then the I did the Hogman and Christmas specials. Yeah, because you oh, said yeah. that it was 2000. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did the one where we killed off the lighthouse keepers. They're going to not do that. Um, it was a season of them with the cowboys mm-hmm. and uh, things like that. So I think it was season four. Uh, season four, that sounds so American. Series four. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what it was. So you so involved... that would have been when the, the guys cut off the skin and... No, no, that was that was series one. It, was that series you, one? I think yeah. Michael got involved when um, Big Jock... Uh, Percy, oh, Percy, 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 that Big was Jock. the... Absolutely love. Yeah. I love Big Jock now. Big Jock now. <laughs> <laughs> was he you know in f- season one and two? No, I think that was, that was like a, oh, later, shit. a later edition. No. Yeah. Big Jock's my favourite part. Is well, that's, I, would just, that's, I was about to mention that because it was an interesting thing. But it's a thing we watch very often. Mm. And I was just sitting, I was sitting at my cousin's... Um, God, that would have been last year. <laughs> the last time I was there. Did, didn't incriminate yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah January. It's illegal sometimes. Last January. Um, I was at my cousin's and we were just sort of sitting up late drinking <laughs> and we decided we'll watch, we'll put a, like a compilation of uh, chewing the fat on. Mm. Obviously watching still games, sort of like just going through all these bits. But the, the big jock bit is like what just garners so much laughter for me because it's just an absolute arsehole of a character. It's amazing. <laughs> Love it. I think, I think if you play golf uh, in Asia you probably all know a big drop, <laughs> yeah. I reckon. Yeah. That's, That's what I reckon. And 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 big I don't play golf, but I, I've I've met these people. But 
genuinely, it just used to make me laugh. I thought Ford was hilarious at it. It was like, <laughs> hey, and all this kind of stuff. It just, it, it, him and Mark Cox uh, in anything yeah. just starts making me laugh. It, it, it's really funny. You know, the way Mark Cox speaks, particularly when he's Tam, and when you sit around for um, a read-through, and you're saying, hi, guys, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, oh, my mid dad. And then you just start laughing, you know, and I'm sorry about my accent doing it. But that's a big jock now is classic. Well, that, was, that was pretty good. I quite liked that, Tam. That was a great that Tam a there. pretty good Tam. Yeah. That was awesome, man. <laughs> awesome. So so what was the move like from, <laughs> like, 50-50 to chewing the fat? That must have been a weird, a weird transition. Well, not yeah, but... Still working like the kids, guys, I mean, you don't necessarily... <laughs> You, well, no, you don't necessarily work in television, but you watch an awful lot of comedy and you know what's funny and you like cracking mm. jokes. So I, I was into my comedy and my sketch shows. You know, I grew up watching Not the Nine O'Clock News. or um, I remember not being allowed up as a little kid to watch Mount Monty Python. I was too young for that, but watched it later. But Not the Nine O'Clock News uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I loved sketch shows. Um, so w- when we came to do a sketch show, generally, apart from occasionally asking, like, like, Ford would say, oh, that's a smashing shot in relation to a pub. Once I'd learned that, then the rest of it was fairly easy to understand. And mm-hmm. I very quickly realized that Chewing the Fat was mainly mainly a catchphrase show. You know, a couple yeah. of fannies going to do that, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And once you understood that and then you understand how to make that punchline work, it's not so difficult. The di- big difference was I'd done... Um, I'd done children's drama on single camera, so I was used to working in that. Things like 50 15 Saturday morning kids shows were all on multi camera, you know, seven or eight cameras live, and that's quite scary. It's a very different beast. It's like doing the hydro shows. And when you're in children's, you get trained in both as a director, but not in any other area of TV. So there's very few of us in Scotland that do multi camera and single camera. That's probably really boring for all your listeners, but the <laughs> fact is, is you. It, it wasn't such as big a change as it might have been if I'd only done one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. You gonna... no? No. Uh, so yeah, uh, I wanted to move in um, just to. So what are you? Uh, so right, uh, take it from the area of receiving the script. What are you doing from then on? Are you looking at the script and then trying to like visualize everything the way it's getting set up, the way the cameras are going? Could you explain your role? Sure. So director is responsible for every single thing you see on the screen, Mm -hmm. apart from listening to the words. So the writer does the words and the writer will indicate how they've imagined the scene. So I'll give you an easy example, guys. Imagine um, there's a scene that says, we open the back door of a kitchen and see a granny inside drinking tea. Mm -hmm. So you go, okay, well, that's easy. But then you say, how do you tell people, oh, she's a granny without saying, hello, granny? Do you have Will's best grandmother on a mug? Do you have a photo of her grandchildren in the kitchen? Is she drinking out of a mug or a tea set? Is it a posh tea set or is it just like a few different mugs? Um, is she sat down? Has she got a table in the kitchen? Is it a big kitchen or is it a small two up two down four in a blockhouse? And once you start asking the writer all those questions, you get an idea of who the grandmother is. And my job is to ask those questions, often find the right actor to play that, tell costume what they're wearing, tell makeup what they're wearing, tell design what kind of mug they're drinking from, what the place looks like, tell locations where I want to film it, tell my assistants what time of day it is we film it. And I have a whole number of heads of department and it's like spinning eight different plates and eight different sticks at once. You just need to look across the whole thing. And then finally I decide what size of shot should she be in when she says, oh, hello, you know, blah, blah, blah. And 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 so, for instance, if if you've got, Leonardo DiCaprio waving cheery by on the side of the Titanic and you've built a boat, the last thing you want to do is a big close-up of him because the designer will go, oi, I can spend millions of dollars on the yeah. boat, show me the boat. <laughs> yeah. so, and also, if that per- it depends where you stood watching it from. So quite often it's a series of logistical uh, decisions and then you make creative ones. So in Still Game, Jack and Victor come in the pub. If they're going to go, uh, look who it is, Nate, blah, 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 then you want the two of them in the same shot because it's always a pair, Abbott and Castello, Ant and Deck or whatever. You don't want to cut to singles of Jack and then Victor. You want to see Jack and Victor. So you say, right, well, Bobby the Barman's talking to the two of them in a two shot. So if they're in a two shot, it needs to be wide enough to see them. Who else do I see in that shot? When I cut back to Gav, who's playing Bobby, do I want to see, he's not, there's no point in him being big close up because you at home would go, whoa, that was a bit of a weird cut. So you start to, look at a script and say what's the most important thing and in a sketch show like Chewing the Fat uh, it would be um, let's say for instance it was the lighthouse keepers it would be the two one of them at the end going going to do that 
how, just going to know, right? And you know when you do that, that usually that's been caused by Ford's character doing something to Greg's cam- character. Mm. So then you go, well, what is he doing? Where's he done it? How do we set it up? How do we pretend we're in a lighthouse when we're in Mary Hill? And then, and then you start to work your way through the script. And so basically my job is to instill gamers to look at every single line and think where they stood, how are they saying it, and um, every other thing, decision creatively about them. And then you pass that on to your team. Yeah. God, that sounds like a pain in the ass. That certainly does. <laughs> Complete power trip. But you also have to remember, actually, in Britain, comedy is much harder than drama, although I know you'll get a drama director who will tell me to shut up. But in... Mm. in in drama, if, if say in EastEnders, someone says, I love you, there's only three ways they can say, I love you. They can say, I love you, as opposed to he loves you. I love you, as opposed to I'm fond of you. Or I love you, as opposed to I love them. That's it. There isn't any other way of doing I love you, really. Of, you know. Mm-hmm. And you have to decide when you're filming that, is it difficult for him to say, or is it difficult for the person to hear? And that decides your edit. Full stop. In comedy, you've got to do all of that and still make people laugh at the right time yeah. at the end of it. And often in Britain, writers aren't in the drama that they've written. Very rarely do you get a drama where the writer is in it. But in comedy in Britain, almost all comedies I can think of, the writers are in it. Apart from Two Doors Down, actually, that's one of the few comedies where the writers aren't in it. Mm -hmm. But everything else, from Catastrophe, from Peep Show, from Fleabag, from Still Game, blah, 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 the writer's in it. So they know exactly what they want. um, And they know exactly how they should be saying it and where they are. So to direct comedy is much trickier. Um, Peter Kay sacked his director on Phoenix Nights and said, I want to direct him myself because no one else understands the comedy but him. I, I disagree with him. I've, I've had a chat with Peter about it and said, you just need the right director. But directing comedy is tough. It's great fun, but it's very, very different to any other sort of discipline in television. Yeah. It might not be the same, but this is where I, I never understood why some comedy actors want to step away from comedy and become quote unquote serious actors because they want to be taken more seriously as actors as opposed to just being the funny guy mm. and I've always been like comedy is it's like, thing. Comedy, there's, there's, there's honestly, a great I'll tell you both. why I, yeah but do you know the reason why is that is that um, comedy is the Cinderella sister of drama in Britain and if you do a drama everyone's like oh that's posh and if you do a comedy it, it's much less money to make it uh, much less seriously treated um People look down their noses at it. Drama's all important. Comedy isn't. But actually, I think it's the other way around. I think all of us, you two and me, we remember the sketch shows we laughed at, like Chewing the Fat as Kids, or when we were younger, and we loved them. And if you can make comedy with a hard edge and a a point about it, then that'll stick with people longer than any drama. Um, But basically, actors want to do comedy, but the money and sort of fame and kudos is bigger in uh, serious drama. And often they'll go and do it and then realise actually... Uh, they lose Mr. Control, and then they go back. These are writer writer comedians. They go back to doing comedy. If you think about David, um, not David, Ricky Gervais playing David Brent, then he went off and did a few films, and they were kind of like comedy films. But then he went back to doing his own stuff, Afterlife, yeah. and so on. Uh, and I, and I think genuinely, a lot of actors who are good at comedy make a great living doing character actors, but they want to try the hand at drama because they like the variety. Yeah. And I, I, I want to touch a wee bit uh, on the sort of like the time delay uh, between when you hear about com- yeah, comedians going live on stage, they're getting like sort of immediate feedback a lot of the time when they're uh, doing jokes and stuff. You have to think of the time delay that you guys have to go through. You're having to write the jokes and then you're obviously having to do, direct the program to make the joke hit better as best you can at least. And then well, you're having to wait like how long? Yeah, do you have remember to wait? on Still Game. Well, no, it depends on the joke, but in Still yeah. Game. Obviously, what we did was we cut the program and then we showed it to an audience uh, who laughed and we recorded the laugh track. Quite a lot of shows will show it to an audience and leave the bits really long and then go and edit the program according to the laughs. But after after maybe four or five episodes of Still Game, Ford, Greg and I understood kind of what was going to land really well and what would be a, a smaller laugh or what would be a big crashing laugh. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I got it wrong. I remember... Uh, in the hot seat where they're trying to get the hot park bench and Isa's looking for love and she meets a guy and he ends up masturbating under the newspaper yeah. next to her. And I never thought that would get the laugh it did. And it, and if you just let the laugh resonate in my edit, it would have completely swamped most of the next scene. <laughs> so we had to fade it out really quickly, which is an eternal regret of mine. But mm-hmm. the way you do it is you imagine in my edit, right, that'll probably get a laugh. 
uh, if two pints per prick happens once in an ep, it'll get a big laugh. If it happens twice in an ep, which is rare, but if it does, it'll still get a laugh, but it might not be as big as the first time, so I'll leave less of a gap. You yeah. just have to guess it. With experience, you usually get it right. We sorry, I'm just going to do this quickly. We had we had a, somebody on a podcast yesterday, uh, which will be out after this. Yes, annoyingly, she's uh, we we have we have called her the the only Asian style game fan, even though Scott told us that that was wrong. Yeah, but we are now calling her the only Asian style game fan. She's a girl from Singapore. Uh, she does her own podcast on like different stuff. So we're talking a little bit about style game, and uh, I played this sample. Uh, Neat point. Uh, one of the funniest. <laughs> fucking, that's my fucking. That's my favourite thing. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, uh, that got a huge laugh as well. It's fucking. Just wee simple things like that are just hilarious. It's, it's, it's the unnecessary aggression for <laughs> such an innocuous <laughs> issue. I think that's what it's causes hysterical. it. It's hysterical, isn't it? Yeah. Frank Gilhooly playing Mark the Quizmaster. My favourite thing in that was Johnny Irving, who said, uh, uh, <laughs> who, inve- who discovered. Radioactivity, something like that. He said, and they go, Marie Curie, he said, let's see, shall we? <laughs> wake me up before you go-go. Or, or it's the other way around. Who wrote, wake me up before you go-go? And, and Cam goes, was it Wham or something? And he goes, let's see, shall we? Marie Curie's the answer. And he does it so flat. It was hysterical. And the guy who played Willie Macintosh, yeah. Johnny Irving, he, he died. And Greg and I went to the funeral. It turns out he was like a world's famous ballroom dancer. And also had learnt the harmonica off Larry Adler or something. He was a total righteous Jesus. entertainer, and I'm kind of glad I didn't know that because I I would have made him do stuff. Whereas he was just so funny. But Mark, um, Mark's very funny in that uh, Frank uh, Gilhooly uh, Nate points prick. And then he he came back when we redid the series. Yeah, he was uh, the, bar. the barman again. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, amazing. However, yeah. I have to contend. I might agree with Scott here because. Um, all of Sanji's family are Asian, and I'm fairly sure they like the fact that their son is in a very popular comic show. So I think he might have had maybe three or four other Asian fans yeah. at least. <laughs> uh, Scott told us about... Sorry, uh, just writing down on the tally, wrong again, times three. No, I, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> I knew it was wrong. <laughs> Number three. Yeah. I'm just making her feel special. Yeah. But uh, Scott was saying that there's a huge... Okay, yeah, no, you're Vietnam right. No one else... Audience. No other minority enjoys still game except for that lady. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Damn, you're making it sound much worse than. <laughs> right, let's get off this topic before Keeping I get it all in. That's what's happening here. Um, <laughs> excellent. So, um... <laughs> I fucking regret this podcast already. <laughs> so, uh, that's just because you're getting dissed. That's just what <laughs> happens. Uh, so, you went from uh, chewing the fat, uh, and how long was it um, until they decided that we we're going to do still game? So what happened was at the end of Chewing the Fat, when we finished Chewing the Fat, they took three sh- three characters from Chewing the Fat yeah. and said, we're going to do three pilot comedies and see how we get on. And one of them was Isabel, the school teacher. Then with Karen Dunbar's permanently sort of innuendo-fearing biology teacher. Yeah. Um, that would have been great. And, mm-hmm. um, then, and then the other one was Ronald Villiers, of course, uh, <sighs> uh, which is brilliant. And then... And then, obviously, Steel Game. Now, I didn't know at the time that Steel Game had existed before then as a player. I genuinely didn't know. So, for me, when I heard they were doing three pilots, um, I was asking what, and they was like, oh, it's the old guys from Two and the Fat, you know, the old guys who do who occasionally do songs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I went away, and uh, I can't remember what I did. It wasn't Bike Grove, it was something. I was away filming something else because it'd taken a while to do it. So, I didn't do the pilot of Steel Game, which was became episode one, Flitton. Uh, Colin Gilbert did it, who used to direct Rabsy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and when you and Angus at the BBC decided to select Still Game as the anointed uh, winning sitcom pilot, we went back in and the two ways in part it was used as the pub and there was a separate barman and a bar girl in it. And um, we decided to rewrite the pub and to bring Gavin Mitchell in to play Bobby the barman. So I reshot all the pub stuff Um and there's a VHS kicking about somewhere of the original pilot of Still Game, episode one, with a different barman in it. Uh, but I reshot that. So when I say I've directed all the episodes, the truth is I've directed all and half the first one, but Colin Gilbert did the rest of the first one. And I always want to make sure he gets his due, because otherwise he'll remind me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you so then, doing... what happened was, oh. then what happened was, this, we liked that. Uh, we'd like to go to series, and Colin had, uh, had asked them, you know, uh, who they like working with. They said, well, we like working with Michael. Let's get him to do the series. So I went back in and said, this is great. Let's let's off we go. And that was us, you know. Uh, we never. I don't think we knew what, what kind of incredible 
thing it was going to become and 62 episodes later, but um, it was good fun. Yeah. So, so hang on, D- does this mean there's currently two other pilots of the Karen Dunbar character and Ronald Valers? Yeah, yeah, kicking around on someone's dusty shelf in a VHS. Oh, maybe it's cleaned it, maybe it's not dusty. Like like full full episodes? I don't know, I never saw them. All right, okay. Oh, right, okay. Um, um, and, and is there any chance of that ever coming out at all? Probably not. No, I mean, why would you? You 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 could do it as a special for the tune of fat fans, but beyond that, people would be like, eh, what's this? Oh, no, yeah, and I also suppose. it's shot in old TV format. Etc. 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 So uh, I don't know. No, and it, to be honest with you, I actually don't know if they were made into pilots as much as they were the three characters picked to go to pilot. It, it was before my time, or I was shooting something else when that was going on. In yeah. fact, I was doing River City. That's what I was doing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we should also cover. Uh, you done uh, some episodes of Balamori. I did. Yeah. So um, they wanted a, a trainee director sort of teaching in the way of directing. So they said, can you come in and do some and teach someone on the way? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I went in and did it. I never got to go to Mull. It was always in the school in, and I'll say it really quietly in case they upset any fans of Alamori in Mary Hill, um, <laughs> where the school was. So uh, but I never got to I never got to travel to, to Mull. But yeah, I did eight episodes. However, I did get to go to Paris with Alamori, which was tremendous fun. Well, they found in Paris or was it just a, a holiday? Yeah, we all went on holiday to Paris because we're all pals. No, it was filmed in Paris. It was filmed oh, was it? there. Oh. I thought I thought it was all filmed. So we in... went. Professor, it was teaching Professor Archie to build an Eiffel Tower out of yogurt pots, and it was clearly in the days when BBC Children's had money. Because yeah. rather than him show a picture of the Eiffel Tower and then do it in Glasgow, off we went. And then also, mm. uh, <clears throat> what was the name? Penny and Susie. Uh, they they had to go to the market there or something, and. Um, so we did two episodes out in Paris over a few days. Amazing, amazing. So, right, uh, back to Still Game. Uh, you had, obviously, an extra job in the first series, uh, which is the producer part. What extra things did that add to your list of work, which is already incredible that you go through as being a director? Yeah. What extra stuff are you doing so, as a producer? So producer is responsible for the overall creative vision if you're that kind of producer. Producers fall, fall into two types. One is the overall creative vision and managing of the show, and the other one is a money kind of producer who looks after the overall budget and stuff. So a producer will normally agree with the director that the crew that you're getting on board uh, discuss their wages and agree rates with them with the production manager, book all the editing facilities, basically all the massive, massive administration that goes on behind being the creative wanker that the director is. And... um, looking after the days, the health and safety, the catering, uh, making sure all the costumes are in the right place, make sure we've chosen the right locations and we can afford it and we've got security and just every little detail that as a, as a director you would never want to think about because you're too busy concentrating bringing the words to life. And you have a really strong team behind you as a producer. You have a production manager who does all that money stuff for you and they have a production coordinator and they have a production secretary. And there's quite a big team there, but... Um, it's that kind of thing. And also negotiating with the talent. And then you have executive producers above you who represent the channel or the commissioners or the company you're working for. So on mm. um, um, Still Game, when Angela Murray came in and produced, uh, she's a brilliant producer, she had Colin Gilbert above her as an exec producer and Ewan Angus. So Colin ran the company and then Ewan Angus ran the channel. And then Ford and Greg said, hey, we want to be exec producers. So it ended up in the last series, series nine, I had about nine executive producers above us, which was crazy. <laughs> you know, everyone wanting a bit of the, the pie. Um, and so a producer basically does everything what the director doesn't. And it's a massive, massive job. Even down to things like Ford and Greg will write, ah, um, oh, Tonics Caramel Wafer, Smashing, King of Biscuits. And they'll say, well, can we clear that? Are we allowed to do that? Because it's the BBC. Other, other chocolate wafer bars are available. If we show a variety of other stuff, that's okay, which is why you could show brands in Naveed shop, but right. not in an individual thing. And so clearing magazine covers, clearing names, checking names. So when we did, um, when when the boys, Scran, the episode Scran, when we had David Heyman and they took over the shop and Tom Russell, the rock DJ, came in and bought Big Big Cox now or whatever it was called. We had to make <laughs> sure that we could clear a porn name for a magazine and get my <laughs> assistant art department to design Big Cox cover um, and things like that. So you, so it's an enormous job. 
And actually, I, I admire good producers because I could not be asked. Really, it's an enormous amount of paperwork and effort and time. And everyone complains in every job you ever do. And they're the people that have to put up with it. Everyone normally likes the director because they're the pretentious fancy one who makes them look good. Everyone <laughs> grumbles about the producer. So it's a tough gig. And, and I am really, really lucky. And I'm not just saying this. Um, I worked with Angela Murray and I worked with um, Colin Gilbert and I worked with uh, Jackie Sinclair, the three main producers. And they've been brilliant because they let you get on with it. You get some producers who try and tell you what to do. Yeah. Uh, or sit next to you and say, well, I'd do that again. And that doesn't work very well. So they let you get on with it, and it's great. Awesome. Could I ask, um, just where you were talking about like licensing there and stuff, what about the Maduri license? Did you, uh, did you have to personally do that, or was that like you would have had a producer at the time? Or? No, I think, I, think, I think probably because you could show other <laughs> fruit liqueurs available uh, in the shop, Mm-hmm. But we were allowed to do it. But when I look back on it now, I don't think we would get away with that now. Because first of all, you're mentioning a specific brand. And secondly, you're taking the piss out of it and yeah, saying, yeah. if you drink this stuff, it makes some people go nuts. <laughs> and I'm not sure a brand would want to be really st- associated with that. And and the, the lovely line, the Sturi Maduri, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's the dusty bottle that no one buys. It, <laughs> you know, Maduri doesn't come out of it that well. And, yeah. and, and, and also when... Um, when we had the girl come in and eat the chocolate, uh, you know, and the, the kid had eaten half a bar of Cadbury's dairy milk. Mm. What we did in the in the early days, you, you just did dairy milk. And then later on, when all these kind of regulations came in, we actually created, instead of a deep purple foil wrapper, we made a light green foil wrapper. So it didn't, we could argue, oh, it's, it's a different brand. It doesn't look like dairy milk. Um, so you can get away with that kind of stuff. But also, you're not allowed to parody, parody stuff. So... If you're doing a song, you know there's an advert at the moment with a poodle doing the flash from Queen. Flash, burr, there's lots of mud here or something like that. And the guy comes in and cleans the place up. They will have spent a fortune on getting that cleared and changed because you cannot parody words without the explicit approval of the artist. So they will have rang up Queen and said, we want to do this. How much do you want? And Queen would have gone, give us millions. And they would have gone, okay. <laughs> I love the inclusion of a, a from the tune, the Fat Universe, Fusilier. Uh, he's done. He's done that quite a lot, didn't yes. he? Was there other items that? Uh, well, that we do you may know have what missed? we used to have? We used to have tenants. We used to have tenants, up, and then we said because it. And I like real stuff because we always wanted to represent real life. One of the things I loved about it was people would say, "Oh my god, my granddad's house is like, my granny's house is just like that." I remember that in in my uncle's house, and mm-hmm. that used to really please me that it didn't look like a TV sh- set. You know, sometimes you see some programs that looks a bit shitty and new and shiny and yeah. wrong. Yeah. And um, the pub, I always wanted to be really real. So the first few series, there was Tenants and there was Bellhaven, and we could show a variety. But because they always came in and drank Tenants, uh, the BBC said, well, look, this is becoming an advert for Tenants. Not that, not that selling that beer to two uh, jakey old pensioners was particularly <laughs> glamorous. Um, but um, so we, we decided to uh, conjure up Fusilier, which had originated in a chew in the fat sketch, it's never too early for a Fusilier. Yeah. And we just decided to sell Fusilier in future. And then it was our own brand. And if you look at River City, they've got their own brands of beer and, and whiskies and, and stuff like that. Glen Pish or whatever for the whiskies. <laughs> it's amazing. I didn't notice that. No. no. Uh, uh, yeah, and also, if you if you look really carefully, because uh, I always like to put a little Easter eggs in the show and stuff, in the last series, uh, I gave um, all the beer names to the crew. So my uh, DOP, my main camera guy who lit it, Pete Edwards. I think we had Edwards Porter or something like that, or Pete's Best or something like that. And so everyone got their own name. And our first assistant, Wendy Ashman, she had cider named after her Ashman's Gold or something like that. Because you could just make up names and have fun with it. I've got a brandy in still game called Hines uh, instead of Hines um, that, that's got my name on it and um, all that kind of stuff. So everyone, everyone got their own wee, uh, name in there as a brand at some point or another. Surely you would have done a ton of beans you would have thought so, but that was too close to Hind. Uh, is, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I kind of get away with that too much. Yeah. You need too to much. go with the second. Although the design thought. did do me a tin of beans, although the design did do me an exact Heinz can mm-hmm. uh, as a gift with Heinz on it, spelt my way, which is really nice of them. <laughs> Beautiful gifts. Beautiful gifts, man. It's the upside of having friends in design. That's it. That's you it. Get tins of beans. Amazing. So, uh, is, is there any other like mad Easter eggs that you could talk about that, that you have from the show? I think most people knew about the, the blackboard or was had a hint about the episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that was the blackboard in the... in the pub that had something about it. I think most people knew that. Yeah, that was behind uh, the scenes in, in the last season four. Series, yeah, in the last series, 
uh, each episode, I had a countdown. So there was six, five, four, three, two, one to go in every episode. And you, so um, in the scene where there are two mobile phones, behind them it says four to go or something like that. I can't remember what number it is behind the Latin consonant, uh, Gianni Capaldi. So it, in that last series, it, some people found them all, Number one's really tough to find, but you can you can look out for them. And also, and this is a bit pretentious, but I liked it. Me and the costume designer agreed that in the last episode, um, Bobby's shirt would start off checked because he often wear a checked shirt. And as the episode went forward or over the last series, his, his shirt would get darker and darker and darker until it was just black for the last episode. <laughs> um, so we were having a lot of fun doing little things like that. We were messing about with the price board quite often. Um, all the execs got a name check on the uh, beer of the week that kind of stuff. And also in the headline board, I think people know about this in Navid, the, the the sort of daily record or the, the Herald headline board, that was always a joke about one member of the crew. Um, <laughs> so for instance, Stuart Anderson, who's a lovely guy, who was our focus puller. Uh, it, it said sport, Anderson told to focus uh, and, and things like that, uh, which were nice jokes. Um, and it's back to London for Edwards because uh, Pete's from London. So little things like that was good fun to do. And, and where we could, we would drop those in because it was nice for us to do, you know, and, and for people to have a look about and, and see. But that, that 6543211 is the main one, I think, in the last series particularly that we deliberately shot and dropped in for people. Mm-hmm. See, I love all that shit. <laughs> it's, no, it's, stuff, a, yeah, it's stuff I completely miss when I'm watching the, like TV shows and films and stuff, but... I just love hearing like big Well, unless you know stuff. to look out for it, why exactly. would you? Why would That's you think it. about it? You know. Yeah. So, uh, how did it feel after? I think it was six seasons. You you finally were in Still Game as a director, so showing your range as an actor. Oh no, I was in it before then. Oh, were you? I was in it oh. before then. Uh, yeah, I was the Chromatron man who jumps out the window at the end of Hatch when they go, "Where well, we've made a fortune on our shares," oh. and then it cuts to a guy going. All the shares have gone down. Oh, and then jumped out the window. That was me. So that was my first appearance. Shut and up, then I was that. a director in the other one. Yeah, yeah. And then my second appearance was as a director. Uh, and by that point, all the crew knew me well enough to just rip the piss continuously uh, while I was doing it. <laughs> nice. uh, and then I'm in it a third time. And you know what? I can't remember where it is, but I'm in it a third time. But also Ford and I did all most of the voices for the TV. So quite often I would play David Attenborough. Or, and I did a couple of horse races but I wasn't that good at it, and then Ford did the rest of them. Um, so my voice is all over it as well. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so I was in it twice. Uh, I think I'm in it three times, but I can't remember where I put myself again now. But yeah, it, the Chromatron Man was the first one. I never noticed awesome. that. Amazing, amazing. Shit. I wanted to talk about a bit, a bit about, like, did, did you realise from the beginning that this was going to be as big as it is? Because you had, well, you obviously had the success of chewing the fact you knew the show was going to be somewhat big, in some sense, but did you realise it was I going think to be I tell so you what was interesting. I think what was interesting was that Tune the Fat was universally loved by kind of young guys coming home with a kebab on a Friday night watching it and laughing. Yeah. But still game with the little sad bits, with the pathos bits in it, yeah. you quickly realised after the first season that uh, there were women loving it and there were people of all ages and people starting to say, I sit with my granny and granddad, I watched it, or it made me <laughs> ring my granddad up the other day. Or, and it started to have a resonance more than just young guys laughing at it, going, you're a couple of fannies, um, scratching their knackers in their underpants. So I think I think from that point of view, I did. But the biggest time I realized was in series one, when I cast it, I would phone up agents and said, we're doing this new sitcom. It's, uh, do you know Tune the Fat? And they go, huh? And they go, do you know the old guys who sing all the songs? Yeah, well, we're doing a series about them. Series two, I'd phone up and go, uh, we're doing series two of Still Game. Uh, that's the thing that the old guys from Tune the Fat were in. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah. Series three, I had people like Robbie Coltrane ringing up saying, can I be in it? <laughs> so um, so you notice the difference then, and people started to talk about it. Uh, I have to be honest with you, because I've never written a word of it, and, and you know, I'm enormously, it's the thing I'm most proud of still game, but, and I did, and I directed every bit of it, but it's the boys' show in a sense that they've written it and created it and seen it in their heads. And I put it on the screen for them, and I'm not being falsely modest here, because I'm enormously proud of the work I've done um, and the fact that we never killed any, any of each other on set. But the the actual the actual words and stuff like that, I can't take all that credit for it. So I never wanted to revel in it while you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And it was only really, I think, that when they fell out and then we got back together and, we, and, the, and the first Hydro show, 
and I directed the hydro show and I was directing the cameras for the screens in the hydro show. And towards the end of the run, I could trust my vision mixer to do it without me being there. And I walked around the side and there were 10,000 people, 11,000 people laughing their heads off, staring at these guys on the stage. And I thought, fuck me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It, it is something, but it, it would, I think it would be really conceited of me to think, oh, wow, we're doing a great show here beforehand. And mm. also I'm not that kind of guy. So now I'm still amazed that it's become the cultural icon it has, and I'm super proud of it. But it, I, it's not my work in a sense uh, because it's their lives. You don't very rarely do people come up and say, "Do you love in still game was that shot or the color of that picture or the way that he walked?" What they do is they do lines, they do quotes, yeah. and that's not my work. That's Ford and Greg's, and rightly so because it's brilliant. It's hysterical, you know. That's exactly why we wanted to get you on. Another plan of ours was to talk to like camera operators, guys like prop guys and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I think we hope to sort of get a more behind-the-scenes. Of course, speak to the actors as well, yeah. but like do a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff because, again, as I said to you on the phone before, um, not a lot of this stuff gets covered. A lot of the journalists and stuff are going in for like no. the main sort of unique selling points of getting to speak to the actors. That's about the sales of paper. They would sort of leave the behind-the-scenes stuff, and that's what interests me a lot more, I feel. Yeah, it's interesting because the more Ford and Greg and myself worked together, the more they trusted me to go and do the stuff. So to begin with, they would let me do everything because they didn't really understand the art of making TV totally. Yeah. And then they began to get a bit more interested in the making of it. And I would ask him a lot of questions. And then they let go and said, you know what you're doing, get on with it. So the casting, I'm very proud that the majority of the cast, apart from the main cast, I chose. And I would run it past them maybe, or they would make suggestions. But, you know, for instance, um, uh, Frank Liot, Gil Hooley, who played Mark, the, the quiz master, you know, I, I auditioned and picked him and with the producer, of course, and all the rest of it. And he's an iconic character. He's great. And the same with, with um, uh, Eric, uh, Jimmy Martin, who plays Eric. You know, I'd used him in a kid's drama before and suggested him. And, it, and when we look back, it's really weird to have a proper old person cutting about young people. Um, but it worked. And, and you just bought it and you just accepted it. But mm -hmm. Jimmy, I picked and suggested. And I'm enormously proud of that kind of stuff. So... It, some of the things is absolutely I put the stamp on. Um, say, for instance, the cafe or the way the pub looked in the interior or where we actually went to pick the pub and things like that. And you would get Ford and Greg to approve it, but most of the time they would say, go and, you know, go and choose it in the way it's done. My, one of my favorite episodes is Cards or Cared uh, with my horrible accent um, <laughs> because it was 15 pages all shot inside uh, Jack's living room. It was really tricky to do. And the way we filmed that to tell that story, I'm super proud of how I shot that and told that story and, and lifted it off the page and made it happen. Otherwise, it's a radio show. And, all, and that's a classic example of where the words and pictures work together and where they trust me and I trust them and to go. So quite often, they would let me change location of a scene or maybe give a line to somebody else. Uh, if it just said old man, I'd say, well, Eric could say this. But I would never dare to change any words of theirs. And if I ever suggested it, they would just laugh at me and say, we write, you direct, fuck off. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, if I, they ever suggested a shot, I would go, I direct, fuck off, back to them. And that's how we rolled it. So I've got a question which might be dumb, but I'm going to ask anyway, because fuck it. Uh, in, in Kids, there's a, a couple of shots where you uh, film Jack's window from... A, Joe's window. I'm, assu I'm assuming yeah. that's just a zoomed in camera with binoculars uh, shape around it. Is that right? Or is there a specific way to do that? As opposed to what? I don't know. That's what that <laughs> that's kind of my confusion. Okay. So I'll tell you something interesting about that. It's interesting you say that. And it's, it's very well observed, mate, because they wrote this scene and I'm like, and tell me, whereabouts is this other tower that Shug lives in? It's actually from Shug's window, not Joe's window. All right. Okay. And they said, oh, it's opposite. It's opposite Osprey Heights. And I said, every single shot I've done of Osprey Heights, it stands alone on the top of the hill. There aren't any other flats around it. And they went, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's there. Best of luck. And I go, okay, thank you. So for that episode, there was a new block of flats next to it. And what was amazing was if you actually thought through the detail, um, from Jack's window or even uh, Victor's window, you could see Naveed's, the Klansman, Shug's house, uh, probably Buckingham Palace and the fucking moon. You could see anything you wanted to do. It was magical. So the way we actually shot it was this. We went to Kalina Street, where the where Osprey Heights is set, and we hired someone's flat, 
and I had a big, what's called a cherry picker, an up and down crane. And me and the camera guy got in it and we went up in the crane and shot down when it was shoved looking towards the woman with the towel on her hair. Yeah. And we filmed and then we went up higher and changed that set and got rid of that woman and built the table and the curtains and, and put all the cast in it for when they're looking through there to see the cars. And then when we were supposed to be looking out the window back towards Shug, obviously that doesn't exist. So you have to get your head round. I have to make that same room a mirror image of it. So he lowered the cher uh, cherry picker, tilted upwards, and pretended we were in the flat looking back the way. And that's a real head fuck, trying to get your head round the same block of flats is actually opposite each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand that, so, how it's a so, head fuck. So though. basically... Yeah, so me me and the camera guy went up and down in this big crane and we used one room to be uh, Tam's, no, sorry, Jack's, the woman with the towel and Shug's. Um, and it was the same flat that we, in the same window and we just filmed it from different angles. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then in one of the episodes in the last series, the one where one flew over the cuckoo's nest, a kind of homage, they built another flat. And so we, I painted in another block of flats. I filmed the lock off and painted in Harriet was it Harrier Heights um, that got knocked down? Uh, we painted that in. And so they would just make stuff and add it in each week. And then well, there's a block of flats this week. And then next week there isn't a block of flats. And I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. <laughs> okay, and just being conscious of time here, I think we should move on to some of the fan club questions. Uh, went on our Facebook fan club. Sure. So expect some absolute geekiness. Uh, quick fire round. The quick fire round, we like to call it. And yeah, never ends up that way, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Question, two questions here from Stephen Higgins and Natalie Ryan. Uh, have you heard all that new rapper music and do you like the PlayStation? <laughs> no and yes. There you go. Uh, <laughs> as quick fire as we can get there. <laughs> uh, Craig McGilvery, our uh, neighbour across the road. Uh, can you see still game coming back at all? No. No, no I think... I think... Uh, and I listened to Scott's podcast, and and uh, I'd, I'd know for about three years that it, when we were going to finish it, and I knew how we were going to finish it and the end sequence, which I'm normally proud of. Mm -hmm. And I discussed it with the boys and said, you know, we could do this, we could do that, we can have people fade out, and this is how we'd do it. So we'd constructed that end sequence for quite a few years before we decided to finish it. I think now it's gone, and then the last stage play. Have you boys seen any of the hydro plays? I have not. Yeah, yeah I've seen the first one that was, te that was televised. Right. I've missed the second one. Oh, right. yeah, don't watch the television version. It's horrific. Um, it? The uh, the last one, they're all dead. And so everyone's dead. So unless you went back in time to the 50s and did still game as young people, mm. you're not going to, uh, which is a great fun idea, but you couldn't have the actors doing it. Right. Uh, you'd have to recast it. I can't see it going forwards. And I think you're right to leave at the top and leave people wanting more. And Definitely. that's the best way to do it. However, if we all get a massive tax bill in a few years and everyone goes, oh, fuck, what we're going to do? You never know. <laughs> um, one from John Skinner uh, do you ever feel like the unsung hero of the shows uh, like Still Game uh, or are you happy with the cash Jesus am I happy with the what with the, with the, sorry I started laughing there or are you happy with the cash oh with the cash yeah. <laughs> I was never happy with the cash no <laughs> one in television is ever happy with the cash um, I don't feel like an unsung hero because I'm not the kind of person that thinks that way I'm, I'm massively proud of it and, and anytime I've been out for a beer with Ford and Greg you know within two seconds of going into a pub people are coming over for photos and a chat and a, and can you sign this and all the rest of it and that's exhausting and they do it brilliantly but I can't man I couldn't put up with that so yeah. the, actually no I'm enormously proud of it and it, the three of us won the lifetime achievement BAFTA thing and that was a real recognition of the work I'd done on it and, and that makes me enormously proud I don't feel like an unsung hero. Um, I think the boys recognise the work I've done on it, and uh, people have loved the show, so that's enough really for me. And that and that's genuine. That's not me being kind of falsely modest or anything else like that. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I was never happy with the cash. I'd like more, please. <laughs> uh, question here from Sandy Mackey: uh, Has anyone noticed that on the BBC iPlayer, the song they play in the last episode when they all disappear has the lyrics? But if you watch the same episode on Netflix, it's just a tune with no lyrics. Anyone know why this is? So he was asking like people on the Facebook, but I thought I'd ask you. Uh, I don't know that, but I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll have a listen because I think that Netflix may not have... 
it was really expensive to get Bob Dylan's track to use. Mm-hmm. So on BBC and BBC iPlayer, we got it cleared for that. Uh, to use it on Netflix is in international territories. It probably cost a bomb. So it might actually be a sound alike, in which case the Dirty Bastards have done that without telling us. Right. Um, and so I'll have a listen to it and actually see if it is the instrumental version or actually if it's one of them sound alikes mm-hmm. and it's not the same song. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll watch on Netflix and let you know. No problem. There's also the question that uh, I think it's the TV theme and the DVD theme to Still Game are different. Yes, that, that used to be the case for the first few series because the production company that made it hadn't cleared the music from the Cuban boys and so they got the dubbing editor to, to rewrite the DVD music uh, from our dubbing editor and so it's a, it's a completely different tune uh, and I'll just leave it as that. <laughs> All I found out about that yesterday as well. Yes. yes. Um, how come Methadone Mac didn't get his own spin-off? <laughs> That's the commissioning editors and not me. That was uh, from Danny Chief. It's all right, that was my uh, phone. I'm just sorry, I'll just switch that off. (laughs) Um, Did Jane McCurry... Come on, carry on. uh, Did Jane McCurry, uh, he says, my future uh, (laughs) ex-wife, or any of the boys, uh, add a line that just had to be one of the uh, later become iconic in the series? Uh, I'm just thinking about that off the top of my head. No, but do you remember the end of the episode, actually with the pub quiz, where uh, Kate Dickey has her child, she's pregnant, mm-hmm. and the actress has a, the, the one of the girls in the pub team has a baby, and Jack and Victor have done the medical quiz as sort of lean in yeah. to have a look, and then they faint. Paul Riley came up with an idea where they said those two would faint to reveal Gab who would faint, would reveal Winston who would faint. And quite <laughs> often on set, Paul Riley particularly, or people would suggest a, a movement or physical thing rather than a line and say, well, it'd be funny if this happened or if we did this or we did that. And sometimes I would suggest, you know, different ways of exiting or falling or whatever. And the boys would really like it and we'd go for it. So one of my favourites is, is when Winston um, goes up and does the opening um, for in the hall in the when he becomes an internet sensation and Bernie Hunter, who ran the fan club in her wheelchair, says, get off the stage, you fat bastard, through the Stephen Hawking machine. She came, we'd invited her along to be part of the crowd that night, and Paul and I were there, and we said, wouldn't it be funny if she was one of the hecklers? So we just phoned Ford up and Greg up and said, look, the, someone shouts, get off the stage, you fat bastard. Are you all right if we make it Bernie? Because it's really funny. And they were like, that's great. So you would check stuff with them, but you would never rewrite stuff. Yeah. Uh, I have one last question, and I'll pass over to Craig quickly. Um, Judy Lynn, uh, hi Michael. Uh, will we ever see any outtakes from the show? Uh, no, I don't think you will. Okay. Uh, Paul Riley has some that he might want to show on his theatre show, uh, but I don't know. We made an outtakes reel for uh, the rap party, but most of it involves quite a lot of swearing, uh, yeah. so I don't think it will ever be televised. <sighs> Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> so this one is from Rachel Morrison. When producing Scottish shows with well-known actors appearing in both, what's the formula to getting them to to be unique in their own rights? You mean in our show? I think so. Do you think? Do you think that's what she means? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think it's down to actors being good at their job because each character is different. So when David Heyman came in and played uh, Vic the Clydeside Poisoner. He played him differently to how he normally plays um, uh, dangerous thugs or policemen, you know, mm. and um, he was brilliant at it. Uh, but at the same time, when you bring people in like Robbie Coltrane playing a mad bus driver, you want Robbie Coltrane to do that really well because he's a very funny, brilliant actor. Yeah. And so you say, how are you going to play this? That's funny. Off you go. I think also in Still Game, the the lines generally are really funny mm-hmm. uh, and the characters are funny. So you don't have to do too much to it. And you know, we were wary of bringing in a celebrity just for a, a celebrity. It was important they came in and fitted the character role. And, you, you know, I would still have to tell them, cut, do it again. It was a bit rubbish that, politely. But you would still have to push them to, to make sure that they got it right in that show. And if you think in Two Doors Down, with Elaine C. Smith, who plays Christine, uh, she's completely different to Mary Doll from Rasby Nesbitt. And it's the same actress, yeah, and yeah. she's funny. It, it's just actors being good at their jobs, I think. 
And also the director and the writers need to make sure that the parts are written differently enough, unless you're bringing someone in specifically to be a well-known person, you know. Yeah. This is the, the final question. Are international audiences ever a target? That's from Victoria Schwa. There's an awful lot of expats. There was an awful lot of expats. There was people in Australia organising charter flights to come and see the live show, I, I heard. Mm. I think there's a lot of expats that love it. Uh, my my family in, in Birkenhead love it because it's a working class port like Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's got quite a cult following in, in Britain. People abroad love it. I, I know Americans and uh, Scandinavians and things like that who absolutely love it. It tends to be not massive everywhere, but if you like that humour and they get into it, they love it. And quite often what happens is someone will say, I introduced so-and-so to Still Game, now they can't get enough of it. I hear that all the time. Yeah, That's yeah. great to hear. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a pal who says, oh, I showed so-and-so this, and then next minute they all love it. Someone said that the Foo Fighters, David Grohl loves it, and I think that's actually true. I don't think that's made up. And that's someone would have met him and shown him it, and he would have gone, this is great, let's watch it, and then they watch it. Uh, the Netflix subtitles are, are pretty much mainly wrong in every single instance. So fuck knows what they think they're listening to. But um, it's, it's lovely to hear, uh, even if they can't understand most of it. Awesome, man. Awesome. Do you have anything else you want to add, Craig? No, that's all right. So I could talk to you all day, but I'm, I'm very conscious of time here. And uh, so, but again, thank you very much for joining us, man. That's much appreciated. No, it's been lovely to like talk to you guys. It, uh, is there anything I, you uh, want no, to add? No, I don't think so. I think... No, I don't think so. I think I think just to say that uh, Scott made a really interesting point when he said uh, uh, when we came back after the guys had, had got back together and then we did the stage shows, that's when we realised we didn't own Still Game anymore. The people owned it. And that sounds really wanky, but it's true. Mm-hmm. There was a real responsibility when the TV show came back in 20, was it 16, 17? I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, to make sure, yeah, 2016, to make sure that we were making a show for for the people who loved it and and you guys will acknowledge this like lots of people when it first came back everyone went said oh it's not as good now they love it but yeah. nothing's ever as good as what you remember yeah. uh, and it looked different of course because it was it was different technology and different editing and it was on BBC One and blah 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 mm-hmm. but actually it was a real responsibility so uh, when people talk about still game now I kind of see it as this distant not distant thing but this thing that's out there that the public own and I was really super proud and honoured to be part of it. Uh, it's only when I really think, I'll tell you a very, very quick story to finish off. So my best pal, he does um, things like Halftime at the Super Bowl and U2 and Robbie Williams and all these kind of shows as a multi-camera director. He's a brilliant guy. He was doing Miss World and he phoned me up from Jamaica and he said, I'm in, I'm in Jamaica filming Miss World. What are you doing? And I said, I'm freezing my testicles off in Mary Hill shooting still game. And it was the episode <laughs> where they were trying to auction for the car and the wind was howling round us. Oh, and at, at the time, much later when we met up, I remember saying to him, do you know what? Actually, joking about, I wouldn't have swapped swapped locations for anything in the world because mm-hmm. when you're having fun on set, doing that kind of thing, even though it's freezing to death and people's wigs are blowing off and all the rest of it, <laughs> when you know you're having a laugh and you're enjoying yourself, there's no better place to be. And that's the best, best thing I can say about making Steel Game. And um, that's my abiding memory of it. Astounding, man. Perfect. Perfect way to end right there. Perfect. Okay, cool. Let all you right, know. guys, I've got to go. Lovely to talk to you all. Thanks no for your time. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.